Is it the temperature good for you? It, do you feel hot? I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Let, let me know if it's hot again. No problem. Okay. Okay. So, um, hello and welcome to the third uh, episode. We can uh, call it like that of LMAY. Let me ask you. And today I'm uh, meeting a good friend of mine again uh, that I've known for many years. Uh, we've done short films together back in the days, and this is uh, Jimmy Ling. We are here in uh, Jimmy Ling studio. And uh, hi, Jimmy. Hi, Cedric. <laughs> Can I say that you are a composer and sound mixer? Uh, yes. Yes? Yes, you, you, you may. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> okay. Uh, even though you told me you haven't been composing that much lately, like your last score was three years ago? Yeah, kind of, because uh, I switch my, I shift my main uh, work for, uh, workload mm. as uh, from uh, composer uh, focused to uh, uh, a re-recorded mixer mm. that we usually uh, do the final mixing. Yeah. Yes. So right now we are in uh, how do you call it like JLMX or G Meaning Studio? What's the what's the official name of the place here? Uh, okay, it's actually called. Uh, uh, Jimmy Lean, uh, there's no music actually. Okay. There's more, more like a Jimmy, uh, Jimmy trading, Jimmy uh, <laughs> trade. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Let, uh, okay, Jimmy Global, Jimmy Global Trading Company Limited. Wow. Yeah, sort of like that. Uh, well, because uh, I want to uh, expand mm -hmm. the the company from only doing music or uh, some mixing into something that I can uh, actually uh, maybe more than that. Okay. Not just as a uh, operator mm. or creator or user, actually jump into a bigger picture that I can uh, work with, uh, uh, work, work something mm. for the whole industry. That's an interview that we will do in one year. Okay. <laughs> I because probably, I, uh, <laughs> I know you're not ready to go into the details of that particular uh, project, <laughs> but I think it's very interesting. So yeah. we will meet again. Okay. We'll that, that's what the, the James Bond villain said. Maybe, we'll meet again, Mr. Bond. Maybe after a year, I'll be uh, working in uh, Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> then I would have a big bag, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me read my questions. Okay. Um, how did you start your career in composing? And was there a particular moment or film score that uh, set you on this path? Well, uh, actually, I, I think it, it, it's dated back to like uh, 2000, oh, uh, 2009 or, or 2008. Well, I, I was a, uh, a guitarist. I was a guitar player in a in a uh, we call underground rock band. So we have uh, achieved something, but not super famous. But then one day uh, the band actually just collapsed. Yeah, I think it's probably uh, because we have different uh, different uh, ideas about how the music should sound. Everything is different. Everything becomes different after you sign the contract with major labor so it became different so then we actually just dismissed so, so you signed the label and then we dismissed wow yeah we, we actually uh i wouldn't say sign a label we actually go into sign a label uh, okay the contract was and there all the conversation that yes. followed this opportunity went yes. to the band exploding yes okay. all the opportunities there and i think that's the point when we say uh, we should become more commercialized, mm. or we should keep ourselves uh, to be to 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 still be who we are, who, who we were, as a a, a, a band. Mm. Yeah. So at that point, we actually uh, fight. We fought, mm. and we kind of questions <laughs> each other, like what okay. the hell? <laughs> yeah, and then we dismissed. You are not a pure artist. Yeah, kind of like that. Then, then we dismissed. Uh, okay. There's still a bunch of other things, but I think that's the main issue. Okay. The main core of the problems. So, okay, this happened, but then I still don't know how you move to scoring films. Okay, so I wanna, uh, I wanna keep my. Uh, at the point, the band dismissed because I was kind of set my career uh, as a uh, become a rock star mm. at, the, uh, at that time. Yeah. So the band dismissed, and I was like, okay, so I probably, I, I have nothing to do. I, I don't know what can I do, or what, uh, who can I be. Mm. 
Yeah. How old are you then? I think that was like twenty uh, something. Okay. Yeah. So then there was a, uh, uh, I was I would call him a a mentor. So he actually there was a mentor and uh, he used to play in a local band. Yeah, and he wrote some songs for uh, and they were famous. Yeah, he wrote some for uh, the the very famous singer uh, Jiang Hui. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, he asked me like, uh, "Do you want to try to uh, compose, to make some music for uh, for uh, media like mm-hmm. TV, mm-hmm. films?" So at that time, I was like, "Okay, I'll try. It's a sort of a way I can uh, keep doing music to feed myself." I see. Yeah, because I, I guess I didn't want to uh, become a uh, engineer yeah. as my parents wished. Mm. Yeah, even my. Uh, My major was in uh, electrical engineering. Yeah, then so uh, I, I I started to compose music for TV year after year, and uh, I have a lot of uh, credits. And then one day, I feel like I don't want to be just like that because I'm not a uh, very uh, classical trend or uh, we call uh, academic mm-hmm. trend mm-hmm, mm-hmm. composer. So. I I want to achieve more. I want to be better. So then I decided to uh, drop st- uh, to to drop the career for to stop the the career for like a couple of years. Then I went to San Francisco to uh, study film and uh, film scoring. Mm. Then I came back. Yeah. And that's when you came back that I made you. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and the one thing actually motivated me to uh, to 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 to. Uh, Make me uh, love the film score. It's actually the film, uh, the per- perfect storm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the composer was uh, James Horner. Yes. Yeah, I, I really love that because of the the French horn, the the brass used in uh, in a film. It actually touched me. Okay. So that was one of the motivation that I want to uh, to study to be better. To compose for a film mm. because I used to compose for mostly TV. I see. Yes, and um, you've always been driven by a very strong ambition. Is it safe, safe to say that you always want yeah. to know, like I want more, I want better, I want stronger, I want more important, I want yes. significant. I mean, that's interesting. Yes, that, that's one thing. But I think the main motivation is a bill you have to pay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, some. I think that's one. I, I I have to say, that's one of the motivation. I won't lie. Okay. Sure. Yeah. But uh, that's just the half. Mm. The other half is the yeah. I want to. I, I want to. Uh, I want people to hear my music. Mm. I, I want it to uh, achieve something to see my name on the big screen. Uh, that I actually uh, uh, grow up to to grow with. A uh, film mm. from the beginning to the end. Yeah, I think that's something. Okay. Yeah. Except for uh, running time and probably budget, what are the differences between composing for film, TV, and advertising? If you've done some as well. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I I didn't do a lot advertising. That's kind of you know film scoring for film, film composers, TV composers, and. At composers, we're actually uh, different groups, and we don't actually see each other a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I, I would say for TV because the the way we watch TV is that you probably watch it at home. You probably watch while watching it. You probably still uh, also doing something else, like doing your laundry, like you're eating your stuff. So the music actually has to be pretty uh, uh, the the density. Has to be pretty uh, the tense, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Because uh, the moment you uh, you you shift your focus back to the 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 content, the music have to uh, take you into it right away. That's total totally different from watching a movie. When you're watching a movie, you will be pretty focused. You will be probably uh, you will be in the theater. You will do nothing else. Just watch a movie. So the music actually can uh, uh, sh- can take a step back a little bit, just to help the story. So usually in the film, 
you don't see, you, you won't hear a lot of music. You will be driven by very subtle music movement or maybe a lot of sound effect, but mostly the story mm. itself, the video, the image. But for TV, you will constantly hear a lot of music because the moment you shift back from like doing a laundry and you see the, oh, what's happening right now? Mm. Is it uh, sad? Is it happy? Nah, yeah. yeah, the music have to tell you right away. I see. Yeah, that, I, see. I think that's a different. Yeah, mm. and for, for the ad, uh, uh, I didn't do a lot of ad, but my feeling about ad is uh, it has to be very catchy mm. right away. Uh, very strong, very straightforward. Is it a happy Madonna movie? It has to be happy all the way. There's no uh, uh, intro. There's no uh, bridge or outro. It's just totally like... To the point. To the point. Mm. A chorus, very strong chorus like that. Mm. How do you work with uh, directors to ensure that your music aligns with their vision? And what are the steps from concept to final composition? Uh, usually I, I, I talk to director. Hi. <laughs> yes, usually we chat. Yeah. We chat a lot of things other than the film. Right. Yes. Uh, because uh, I, I like that because uh, in, the, in the very beginning step of, uh, of the, the score production, I want to know the director, what's he, what he likes or she likes, what's his personality. Because your personality will uh, affect your choice of music or how you want to do it, your aesthetics. So I want to know this guy. Is it chill or is it very uh, serious mm. or ADHD <laughs> like that? So, so you have a, a kind of like psychologist approach to composing score? Yes, no, that's the very beginning. Mm. So when I know this guy, I, I would become like sort of, sort of like friends. Then I know maybe I have to get into your head like, why you edited this scene like this? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to tell the audience? So my music can help to uh, compose, to tell the story that's behind the screen mm. or that's something that's not told on the image, maybe some, under, some uh, emotions underlying it. Uh, the music should do that. Mm. So in order to do that, I have to know you. What are you thinking? I have to become you. I see. Yeah. Going back to the previous questions, because yeah. of what you're saying, would you say that on TV, you, uh, you illustrate what's on the screen and what, what is shown, but in movies, you are illustrating what is not shown? Yeah, you can say that. that that's a general, kind of general direction. Yeah. For TV, you just like, sh something, what's on the screen, then I just give you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not uh, not one hundred percent. But sure. yeah, but I think that's kind of the a, a general way that you can uh, describe it. I see. Yes, this is a. I'm an old guy, and I have those images of um, like John Williams uh, directing a, a, a P, uh, like a, an orchestra with like fifty people, sixty people. Uh, but right now in Taiwan, are uh, full orchestras still commonly used for film scores? or are they mostly replaced by digital elements, which are actually sometimes quite convincing? Mm -hmm. and, and so related to that, what uh, technologies and software do you use in the uh, composing process? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, people are, uh, people are the, the first question that the people are trying to uh, get the score done by real recordings, I think it's a trend and it's also make a lot of differences, that's for sure. But because of the budget, the time, so maybe we, uh, people don't really have that ability to uh, actually record it with the real orchestra. So the uh, hybrid score, we call hybrid score is that maybe just some key elements, key instruments were recorded, like solo elements, like uh, maybe uh, solo violins, maybe guitar, those stuff. But the rest is actually uh, we call VSTs, virtual instruments. Yeah, and the virtual sample libraries nowadays are really brilliant. They're actually pretty great. Yeah, I, I, I see, I, I, uh, back, in, back into uh, graduate school in San Francisco, one of my tutor, my, my professor, 
he actually worked with uh, Alan Silvestri, and I saw the 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 the, the working project. It's like unbelievable real. Yeah, mm. but the work behind it is like hundreds of hours, I guess. Mm. So I think it's uh, it's a trend and it's a reality that you have to work with that. Yeah, so, uh, okay, the second question is what kind of equipment I use. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I mainly use uh, two libraries, uh, East West, that's... Uh, they advertise it as a Hollywood standard. <laughs> well, I would say, yeah, it's kind of a Hollywood standard. It's uh, very lush. Yeah, and so another, uh, I, I really like it. And another one library I use is a Vienna, a Vienna Sample Library. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, VSL, yes, v Vienna Sample Library. Um, they actually make the uh, library pretty classicalized. Okay. It's very dry, it's very, it sounds like more towards uh, used in uh, classical music, mm -hmm. classical trend. But the thing is, uh, it's very uh, dry compared to a uh, Hollywood standard, mm -hmm. East West. The East West has a lot of reverb, mm -hmm. so it sounds lush. But it's not dry, it's not direct. So you sometimes feel it's, it's, it's waterized, it's... Um, it's kind of uh, covered with a fog. I see. So sometimes uh, when you see the real thing, you don't feel it's beautiful. But with the fog, you don't see the real thing like very clear. Mm. You feel it's beautiful. Like a bit dreamy. Yes. It's, there's a bit of the same thing in photography. If yes. you take a picture like very hot, very digital, very crisp, it's it's accurate, but it's not charming. Too sharp. But if you put like a mist filter, it's like yes. oh yeah, it feels yeah. It's like you put on a filter, and it feels like wow, it's lush. Uh, but the, but sometimes you need uh, that uh, you you need a drier uh, sound to make the like more punchy, more uh, expressed. So I combined with both, the very dry one and the very revert uh, filtered one. Mm. I combine them and usually results are pretty good uh, results. I see. Yes. How do you adapt your composing style to different genres? I mean, like action, drama, comedy, you don't score them the same way. So how do you do it and what are the differences? Well, yeah, I think that's uh, one difficult part. Uh, my main, uh, I would say my uh, main genre, I would say it's action and and horror films. For uh, drama, like love films, well, then you have to, uh, I usually just watch a bunch of love films, romance films, or like comedies. Uh, okay, comedies is uh, interesting. It's comedy, how, how, how do you, uh, the reason you feel is, uh, it's comedy, it's funny, it's because of the rhythm. So it's similar to uh, to like drums. When you given uh, when you make a song, uh, you 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 give a, you, if you want to make a happy song, you usually do uh, compose in a faster beat. So same as uh, comedy. Comedy is easier and similar to what I uh, mainly focused like uh, the the action. The action is a kind of like a lot of beats. Mm -hmm. So the comedy you have to. Uh, use the sound and uh, so, uh, instruments to give the, the whole film a beat. Mm -hmm. So that counts as uh, the characters, uh, the, 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 the characters like action is one of the beat elements. So uh, how to adapt? I think just, I think probably the, 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 the uh, I'm good with uh, rhythm. Mm -hmm. The beat, do, 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 something like that. So, how to adapt? Uh, I think by 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 making uh, everything on a sort of a beat, I mm. guess. Mm. Yeah. And for romance, I think I, I just watch uh, a lot of romance film and and uh, hypnotize myself. <laughs> I'm a full love. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not really where your heart is. This is not your uh, favorite. Well. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Are you familiar with the, the concept of Mickey Mousing? 
Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's your uh, What's your idea about about this? I, I personally I love Mickey Mousing, but sometimes it can also get too much. So, do you how do you balance that? Oh, uh, Mickey Mousing. Yeah, Mickey Mousing is one of the way you do uh, comedy. Mm. Yeah. So uh, usually the back in the old days, uh, like a lot of Hollywood films, comedies, funny films, they do a lot Mickey Mousing. But uh, if you do too much. It feels like pre very, very old school. So right now, uh, like I, I just did a comedy. It shows in a Taipei Film Festival. And we did a lot of Mickey Mouse in at the beginning. But then when I work with the director, we want to uh, present a different style. So we actually cut off, we, we, we delete a lot of scores. So we left just something that's very, very important to uh, hint the audience to tell the audience this is the a uh, comedy mark the, here is a mark here is a cue and the rest we just leave the the uh, the funny stuff to the image i see yeah i think i think the the the, the better answer to uh, to your question is you have to uh, step back and trust the image trust the image itself that it's funny already if you put too much Mickey Mouse in, too much funny on it, it will be too funny. Like too sweet. Too sweet, yes. Mm. Like you put too much sugar on something that's already very sweet. That's too much. The banana is already, already uh, very sweet. Mm. Maybe you need something else to make, to make people feel like, oh, it's very sweet by nature, mm. not by I'm telling you it's funny. I get it. Or sweet. Yeah. yeah. What advice would you give to an aspiring film composer? Are there like any skills or experiences that they should focus on to succeed? Uh, I think they should focus on, well, professional side. I believe uh, every composer is uh, has their own talents, their own skills. So I wouldn't say. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give a suggestion on technical part or talent part. But actually, I would say you have to, uh, if you want to be a composer into this career as a freelance, you should uh, have a, uh, how would say that? You should make a plan financially. Yes. Okay. What do you mean by that? Uh, you should, uh, when, you, when you have a project, when you done, when you finish a project, you will uh, you will make money. So most of the people uh, just spend them all. So saving and investing, I think, it's very important because most of the the talents, uh, most of the composers or uh, uh, filmmakers or, or like in the crew in this industry, most of them are freelancers. So we don't have like most of them don't have like pension very good pension, you have to start to think about the future, not the things you do right now. Because I believe when you decided to step into the career, the to, into this industry, you are skilled and you have your talent. So I think that's a very basic element. So on top of that, I think you should invest yourself for mm. the future mm. because that's the problem of the freelancers. Yeah, most of the people uh, have their pension with the uh, union. Mm. Yeah, but actually, union is not our. It's not actually in our culture. Mm. So okay, you 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 maybe have a little pension. You have a uh, labor pension. You have uh, uh, health he uh, health care. Mm. Yeah, that kind of uh, health insurance. Mm. But then one day, because uh, freelance in Taiwan is. Uh, very, I would say it's kind of unstable. You maybe, yeah, like you have one month, uh, you have a project for like three months, then you get paid. But then the rest of the year, you probably have no project or very little project. And most of the, most of us audio workers, uh, uh, composers, we usually have to invest a, uh, a studio room. Even, it, it doesn't matter if it's small or big. Usually most of us, on debt. So besides that basic skills, I think financial plan and skills, 
uh, and, uh, and invest in yourself for the future, and the skill to uh, talk to people, to uh, become a sales mm. of yourself. I think that's very important. You know, uh, th there was one, uh, uh, the, uh, the composer, the uh, a Japanese composer, Joe Hisahi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe yeah. Hisashi. Yeah, Joe Hisashi, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He said one thing. I, I read his bio. He said one thing that actually uh, uh, inf uh, still affect me till today. That he said, if, you're, if you are a pure artist, you will be avant-garde, but you will starve to death. But if you, if you are a businessman, you probably won't have something great, but you will not starve. Mm -hmm. You will make a fortune uh, without very big credit. So he decided, Joe, he, Master Joe, he decided to become a half artist and half businessman. So he's very successful, but he's also financially, he's very well prepared. Yeah, he, he wasn't started, he didn't start as a very rich, rich uh, he didn't come from a rich family but he knows how to be the sales of he, himself, uh, himself and also to manage his uh, artist career. I think that's very important. You have to have a, a, a good concept about business. Can you explain the role of a sound mixer at the different stages of the filmmaking process? I'm talking about pre-production, on set and post production. Even though here you specialize more on post, but you are familiar with all stages. Yes. Uh, so uh, at the in, at the pre production, the where there's only like script. We're not doing the real filming. So at that stage, as a sound mixer, I will read through the script and circle out like some parts. I think maybe uh, we need some key elements during shooting and talk to the director. Like, uh, there was one project that they has to shoot a, a scene that they sing like karaoke uh, in the KTV, in your KTV. And also they're shooting a scene that uh, with, uh, there's a, how say that? There's a video game uh, conference, the huge conference and they're, uh, they're, they're playing video game. So you need a sound, uh, we call it diegetic sound, diegetic music that you have to play in the, in the, in, in, uh, when shooting. So that's a problem, like, uh, do we need the dialogue from that scene? If we do, then the copyright of the music. Because when you record on set, you record everything. So if the dialogue mixed with the, the, the music on set, it might be a problem. Also, uh, are they going to need some extra, like, uh, care of the uh, location sound? Like, uh, there was one scene, they have a band playing uh, in, the, in the scene. And the band is very, it's like uh, the key elements of the series, of the, the project. So, do we just use boom, uh, boom mic, or do we actually mix uh, on stage, and then we send uh, two track, the actual mixed stuff ready to use and we record like B track that we can use afterwards. So there was one project uh, that is not on air yet. And uh, it's like, it was like, uh, it's a series with uh, like 10 or, tw or 15 episodes. Mm -hmm. Every, each episode, they have one band or singer. So the singing, the, the band is very important key elements in every episode. So we actually, uh, during the pre-production, we, we, we talk to the uh, set manager, we talk to line producer, the, what kind of equipment we need. We maybe have to use to, to record B-Track for uh, post to use. So we talk about equipment support. We talk about how we gonna uh, do this scene during the pre-production. So it's kind of sort of the preparation for the filming stage. Okay. Yeah, so when it then, then when it's in uh, production, we're filming. As a sound mixer, uh, I have to think like, I have to uh, pay attention to all the sounds on set that is maybe we didn't think of during the pre-production. 
maybe there are some key elements. Uh, the the noise, maybe even a little noise that actor or actress that the character made during the 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 uh, shooting. Maybe that's something we need to uh, to 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 record it. Maybe something uh, like okay, like like there was one scene, uh, one film, short film project. Uh, not much dialogue, but the whole uh, the whole story is a father lost his son. His son was dead, so he's making a uh, annual banquet. Like it's a uh, Taiwanese culture, annual banquet. So his son, his uh, ghost, the spirit of his son, will come back to have this banquet with them as a family. So there are not much dialogue. Most of it is uh, making, cutting vegetables, uh, frying stuff, uh, making all the dishes and stuff. So I have to pay attention to it because usually you just use the boom mic to, okay, he's cooking. But how, how he cook? Uh, the, uh, he put this first or he put that? Mm. Or when he stir the sauce? He actually trans. Uh, he actually translate. Uh, tr uh, he actually transform the emotion of his uh, inner thoughts into that little movement. Because when you're happy, you probably stir the sauce like very lightly, very uh, happily. Mm. But when you're sad, when you're missing someone, you actually stir it very slow. You you probably accidentally hit the 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 the, the bowl pad, a little yeah. bit. Mm. You make some noise. It might be hard or it might be light. So this kind of stuff is very difficult to uh, emotionally reproduce during the Foley stage because you won't be able to feel how the character feels as the, uh, the, the, the actor feels as the character. So during the production, I have to pay attention to this stuff and decide to like, okay, we, we need to take that sound. It's not something we can reproduce uh, afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So during the filming stage, I have to make decision that something we really need to catch on set or something that we can leave afterwards. Mm. So I would say making decisions, important, fatal, and very key decisions. <laughs> yeah. So then uh, move to the post-production. I decided to... Then uh, during the post-production, I will look the film, the project in a totally different way because uh, it's after editing. So usually after editing, uh, it might be a little bit different than the script it used to be due, due to a lot of uh, reality problems or creativity uh, stops. So uh, I, will, I will look at it as, a, as I never watched it before. Then I will decide to how to give something uh, that is uh, to support how it looks like right now, not as the script, something like that. So uh, different stage, making different sta uh, decisions. Uh, yeah, but I would say during the post-production, you're actually uh, more, more, more like creating. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, creating something new, uh, not just making decisions uh, as it were. I see. Yeah. And, and it's also a moment where, uh, outside of the sound, I mean, as a director, it's the, there's like three writing stages. First, the script, you rewrite on set depending on the conditions, the actors, mm. and editing is like the last stage of writing. Yeah. And I think from a sound point of view, with with the sound effects, folly and score, you can add another layer of writing uh, as yeah, well. Yeah. Yes. There. So is it, uh, is it the director who tells you, I want this, or you as the, in your case, composer slash sound mixer tell, telling the director, you know, we could do that, we could add this. How, how's the conversation going? Okay, so usually uh, when we get the A copy, like uh, it's uh, after editing, so the director usually will uh, have the editor to put something that he might want this uh, become. Like, like he might 
do some uh, have the editor to do some effect or some uh, reference to show that director what what the director has in mind. So when I receive those, I will look at a different way. I will uh, try to read uh, what the director wants here. Then I will do it in a, maybe uh, in the same way, but to uh, to uh, refine it, to make it sound more smooth or better or else. But the goal is to uh, to achieve how the director wants. But sometimes uh, there are some scenes that maybe director didn't think that we can do this. But as a sound mixer and also a sound designer, I can achieve them with uh, uh, sound effect design. I can achieve with uh, maybe cut off some dialogue that is I don't think it's important. Then I add some uh, sound effect to reflect the character's uh, state of mind, something like that. Try to still to uh, emphasize to to uh, to show what director might wants to help the 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 scene, mm -hmm. the storytelling. About the, the, the tools, uh, we, we spoke about what you're using as a composer. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a sound mixer, it's a, uh, some of them are the same, some of them are different. So what are the, the, the tools and equipment that you use in your work? And are there uh, specific brands or models that you prefer for certain tasks? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, th there are for the for like the location sound recording. Mm. Uh, we th there are actually a, a lot of brands, uh, but as a uh, tech guy, I like to be able to. Uh, my personality is I like to control everything with one, uh, just w w w within my finger, to control everything. Being able to remote a lot of stuff. So I choose a, a, a brand from, uh, from, from the States. It's called Zaxcom. So the Zax, Zaxcom uh, recorder and uh, receiver, wireless mic microphone receiver and transmitter, they are actually a big system that you can actually remote everything from the recorder. So it's very convenient to me. Uh, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, system idea. Actually, there are still uh, other brands can do similar, but not the fullest. So Zaxcom can record, like, can control, uh, Zaxcom uh, push the word remote control to like the limit. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's very stable. And also uh, there's a technology they use, it's called Never Clip. So clipping is actually what we usually uh, encounter on set when the character like have very huge uh, sound dynamic. He actually, he or she probably like shouting, then murmuring. So it's very difficult to uh, follow the, the game stage. So uh, Zaxcom's uh, technology never clip actually help us to achieve the good recording without sound clipping. So we still have to do the again stage following the characters uh, acting. But then I have uh, a little range, safe range, that I'm pretty sure it will not clip. I think it's very smart. Speaking of like shouting and, and sometimes you uh, you shoot outside with traffic, mm -hmm. but if it's a conversation, you don't want to hear the traffic. I mean, this kind of like extreme uh, sound situations. Um, so what are the challenges that you, you meet as a sound mixer on set and, and how do you overcome them? Well, uh, I will try to, uh, uh, the traffic is actually what we mostly fighting for during uh, on set. So I will try to mic the, the actor or actress uh, as close to their mouth as possible. But probably not here, but like if they're wearing, sh wearing shirts, I would say it's perfect because I can go like higher. But if like they're wearing like, um, I don't know, bra tops or like tank tops, it's a nightmare. So then uh, I will try to, I probably will give up on the wild shots, but I will try to catch the phrase, the dialogue uh, as close as possible with the boom mic. Uh, 
during the close shop, uh, close up shot. So uh, leave everything to the post production. The see how much we can use, and we can edit. Sometimes we can use uh, dialogue from close up shots. Uh, we put that sound clip uh, into uh, wild wild shots. Sometimes that works. Sometimes not. Yeah. So I would say traffic. If if it's like so loud and you might have to consider the possibility of ADR. Yeah. Yeah. Want to explain what AD, what is ADR? Yeah, ADR is a uh, okay. ADR is like uh, the A stands for what? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Is a D is for dialogue. Mm. Uh, R is for recording. Additional. Additional? Maybe? I don't know. I, I don't know. Automatic o dialogue. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So ADR is like. Uh, when the production style is not working. So after production, we get into post-production, we record, we, we invite, we have the actor or actress come back to a studio and re-record dialogue, lip sync with the image again mm. afterwards. I think that's a challenge because you get good quality, but you probably will lose a lot of uh, emotions from the character. Yeah, but with uh, there are a lot of experienced, very talented uh, actor or actress. They actually uh, get back into that emotion pretty well. Yeah, but there are still some others don't. You will feel like he's just he or she just uh, reading out the the words. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a challenge. Yeah, but also it's kind of the I would say it's the way the style. How do you do dialogue editing? Like for me, I'm, I'm more uh, I'm more into a way of a generic, more natural uh, sound editing style. So I don't really uh, do the denoise or stuff to 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 make the dialogue so clear. Yeah, I, I wish I, I'm I'm kind of I love to leave something. That is natural on set, still there. It's very realistic. Uh, maybe leave out if the dialogue sounds uh, audible, very easy to understand what he says. Then I would say, why not just leave the back background noise, the traffic there, because the character might be shooting the 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 scene might be like the character is like fighting or chatting under a bridge on the crossroad. Then there's a lot of traffic. Then why not? It's realistic. Then why should we? Then maybe we don't need to do ADR to lose all the emotions. Because I, I believe when you shoot a character, when you have the character talk on the crossroad, uh, on the crossroad or under the bridge, you choose that scene, that location uh, must be due to some uh, some reasons. Maybe there talking about something important. Maybe they're, uh, uh, they're making some evil plans under the bridge. Because when you shoot that, means they don't want other people to know. It's very, uh, it's very discreet, I guess. So why not just leave there? Because sometimes the background noise give you, make you feel stressed. You, have, you feel the pressure of the character. It might be something good. But sometimes not. Mm. Sometimes it's just it's just loud. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I see. Speaking of sound effects um, and and folly, how do you integrate them uh, into the mix? And uh, can you give examples of how a well placed sound effect can enhance uh, a scene? Uh, if uh, okay, so if we say like uh, realistic, we say hard effects. Hard effects is like something that is very realistic, like Foley. Like uh, if you see a car pass by, you, you hear the car sound. That's that's what we call hard effects. If a well placed uh, film with hard effects, you will feel nothing because it's so natural. You will feel nothing. But if it's not well placed, you will feel there's something. So that's one thing. So uh, okay, so let's talk about like uh, designed effects. Uh, I think 
Uh, a very well designed effects will give you the another another layer of the feeling to the scene or the character. Like uh, there's one good example I always like to say the in the Godfather where uh, Pacino is going to uh, kill his first uh, victim. Uh, the scene was actually in an Italian restaurant, I think, or sub subway restaurant. Yeah, and you hear the subway sound comes from like nowhere, and the scene is still in the restaurant. So the sound effects of the subway train actually implies to Pacino's, uh, Pacino's, uh, uh, he's very stressed, very nervous. So the sound designer used that sound to imply his feelings. And then this sound cuts into next scene is a subway train. So this kind of, uh, 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 how to say that, the surreal design actually brings out the character or the story, something that don't show on the screen right away, but puts you into that emotions or feelings and prepare you into the further story. I think that's a well-placed uh, sound effects would do to prepare you that maybe a sound effects make you so sad because the next thing is sad. Then you feel it with uh, maybe, maybe just some uh, weary uh, flute or something. But you feel it's weird, it's kind of sad, then you prepared, then put you into next story. Yeah, I think that's a uh, yeah, well-placed sound effects, I guess. Great. Yeah. Um, last question, and it's kind of like the same as the, the last question of the, the composer part, uh -huh. is uh, what, uh, again, like the advice that you would give to uh, someone who is uh, interested in, in sound, uh, either on set or, or in post, uh, what kind of advice would you give them and and do they have to work on s certain skills or certain qualities to prepare them for this kind of uh, of job? Not the financial <laughs> 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 okay. before more like something like practical like how yeah. do you, do you have to listen to everything? Or? Yeah, I, I think you have to uh, if you want to get into this business uh, well, you, you you should well, I assume that you should be able to uh, to identify uh, even very subtle sound. Uh, like uh, you, you can identify there's a, something unique in every scene. If you want to be a location recorder, location mixer, you have to be able to aware that there's some any not wanted noise or something that is so subtle, but maybe a key elements of the environment of a shot of a scene yeah like like uh when you're shooting a hospital scene usually in the in the hospital uh the 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 usually in the room uh usually it's very quiet but what's beyond that wall makes it a hospital what's next door that makes it a hospital not just a bedroom because everyone sounds quiet, but what's the key elements to make it a hospital, a uh, office, uh, a dungeon? Yeah, like that. So I think you have to very, uh, you have to be able to aware subtle stuff, to yeah, to identify stuffs, and you have to uh, mentally you have to uh, be prepared for very high pressure. Working environment, <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. Um, according to my experience, uh, sorry, according to my experience, uh, the most of the sound crew or film crew I saw on set are, are pretty, I don't know, faceless, not faceless, like emotionless, like they're so tired, like they're they give me a feeling that they they're so exhausted, they're. Maybe they're not tired, but they just look like they're not happy. Yeah. But me, uh, when I'm on set, I'm, I can be frustrated sometimes, but I'm happy mm. because it's something I love. I mean, uh, you have to really love this stuff 
to be in this industry. So like uh, uh, our sound crew on set, we're, we're actually very, we're usually the happiest one. I don't know why. Even it's so exhausted, but we're just, we still have to, uh, the energy to cheer up ourselves, to, to talk rubbish to people. <laughs> For for the for uh, uh, funny wise, yeah, yeah, we, we we still can make jokes. We still, uh, yeah, I think uh, try not to be so. If you feel you're unhappy on set, then you have to think why you're here. Mm. Yeah, if you're not happy. Yeah, I I've had. I'm usually you, you know me. I'm a pretty happy director. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, as well, and and uh, we've done. We're a pretty good team. We we like to have a not a goofy set, but but yeah, make make sure that people are happy to be there, and 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 then I think it helps also to to work seriously together when we can do it uh, with a smile or when we can like crack jokes a yeah. little bit between between takes. Yeah, uh, what we are doing is not uh, brain surgery. Yeah, we are not saving. We can change people's lives. We are not saving them. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I think that's good because uh, th there are a lot of uh, uh, this. Uh, Ten years has gone by, and uh, I'm here like in this studio. I built up this studio for like my company like ten years already. During this uh, decade, I worked with. A lot of crews, uh, film crews, production companies. Sometimes I feel like, why is it? Why, why everyone is so serious? Mm. I mean, on set, everyone is like so frustrated. Why? You're making a film. You're making a project. You should. You're you're making people. You're you What is a film? The, the film is uh, something that usual people. The, the life that usual people will not have. It's a fantasy. Film is fantasy. So if you're making a fantasy, uh, even it's horror film, it's a ghost film or, or whatever, it's a fantasy. Then why you're so serious? Why you're so frustrated on set? I know it's a process, but you should love what you do. But most of the crews you, you see here, I mean, uh, back in Taiwan, I feel like everyone is, most of the time, People are shouting to each other. Mm. They're like hating each other. I don't mm. know why. Mm. Yeah, it's totally different than, uh, I don't know, back in the States, I work with uh, foreign crews. Even in Taiwan, I work with foreign crews. We're actually having fun. That's real fun. We're cracking jokes where uh, there's no, uh, there's not, not a particular person will yell or shouting pre- angry with 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 the crew saying like oh, we're running out of time why don't you hurry up wrap that wrap this wrap that and i don't think that will help uh i think it, it's it's all about like how do you prepare the production when i work with foreign crew uh it looks like everyone is so relaxed but we're usually we're mostly on the schedule even it looks they're Sloppy or relaxed? Well, I wouldn't say sloppy. It's not not right word. Even you feel uh, it, they're relaxed. They're not. Are they really working like that? You know, uh, when I worked with foreign crew in Taiwan, there was one time we were shooting uh, in Ximending. Uh During a shooting, uh, everyone is very serious. And after shooting, when, when we when we switch in a spot to another location on foot. There even a uh, director even went, went to buy uh, drinks, <laughs> buy stuff like, hey, this one is good, I want to eat it, like that. They're actually having fun mm. during the process. Mm. But with the Taiwanese crew, I don't know why. Everyone's just so frustrated. Hey, I don't have time. I have to go do another say. I have to do this. I have to do that. You, you feel there's a lot of things that still needs to be taken care of. Even it's production stage already. But still doing, still like they have something that didn't do well, prepare well in pre-production, still doing right now. Something like that. So many, so much uncertain things. So you're actually doing, uh, I would say, like chores. Mm. You're, you're, you're using your time, like one third of your time doing chores, doing, uh, I don't know, doing shit, shit mm. stops. Mm. 
that needs to be taken care of like a month ago already, then you only have like two thirds of the time really actually doing the shooting. Mm. I think that's a problem that most of a lot of director, I, I feel them or I heard them, they are compromised. They have to compromise. Okay, this is what we got. Okay, I'll just shoot it. Mm. It's not good. Um, thank you, Jimmy, uh, so much for having me. Um, I, I love having this conversation with you. I love uh, your answers. Uh, very straight to the point and no bullshit. I like that. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure, uh, does your company have, except for the very, very complicated name, <laughs> do you have a website that I can put in the comments under uh, the video? Yeah, actually, we, we have our own uh, so website. Will, okay, you will give me that? Uh, yeah, some yeah. Social medias? No, uh, it's just uh, tri yeah, it's just the website. Just the uh, website. Okay. Yeah, our, our Facebook it, uh, is like not it's like only used once or twice <laughs> okay. a year. So I will put the website <laughs> in the comment okay. uh, section. And uh, thank you all for watching. I hope it was as interesting for you as it was for me. And I will see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.